evening. The board now reconvenes this meeting of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees in open session at 7, 12 p.m. on October 3rd, 2017 at the Plano ISD Administration Building. I'm Missy Bender, President of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees, and on the board's behalf, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all who are present and to our web and video viewers. We will conduct our meeting focusing on the district's two major goals, ensure continued improvement in student learning, and ensure efficient use of resources. Let me introduce my fellow trustees and staff. Seated to my left are Dr. Brian Bingley, Superintendent of Schools, Sarah Bonzer, Interim Deputy Superintendent, Nancy Humphrey, Board Secretary, and Trustee Tammy Richards. Seated to my right are Board Vice President David Stolle, Trustee Greg Meyer, Trustee Dr. Yoram Solomon, and Trustee Angela Powell, with Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Board of Trustees, Denise Gillespie. At this time, our board secretary, Nancy Humphrey, will share an inspirational message. Ms. Humphrey. Thank you, Ms. Bender. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is leaving me. It's allergies, I think. Um, during the past few months, our world has experienced what seems to be an inordinate share of tragedies, from hurricanes to earthquakes to Las Vegas. So many are impacted by these events. Those people are in our thoughts tonight, and as we carry on, with our daily lives. Despite adversity, we are always witness to a boundful, boundless and immeasurable outpouring of human compassion, bravery, tolerance, courage, generosity, and selflessness. As Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. Tonight, as we conduct our meeting, May we focus on the impact of our work as on those who we serve in this community and help transmit that infinite hope so that the work done in, done in this school district will prepare our students for this world. Do you want me to lead the pledge? Or? No. Okay, thank you. It is now, thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. It is now the board's pleasure to welcome our Boy Scout and Girl Scout student readers who will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Scouts, would you please come before us in front of this dais here at the front of the room? And as you move up here, would you please stand and join us as they lead us in the pledge? attending tonight and for your service to our community. Would each of you please take a moment to introduce yourselves, tell us where you go to school, your troop, and how long you've been scouting, please. Um, I'm Aaron Ho. I go to Troop 219. I go to the Academy High School and I'm in 10th grade. I've also been scouting for 10 years. Derek Ho, uh, I go to the Academy High School, Troop 219, scouting 10 years. I'm Cyrus Sakari. I go to Murphy Middle School. I'm in eighth grade, and I've been scouting for eight years. My name is Zachary Peters. I go to Reedy High School. I've been a scout for 10 years, and I am in Troop 198. My name, my name is Vivian. I'm in Troop 6567. Um, I go to Hedgecoaks Elementary, and I've been scouting for five years. My name is Taylor and I'm in Troop 6567. Um, I go to Hedgecoaks Elementary. I'm in fifth grade and I've been scouting for two years. My name is Natalie. I go to Hedgecoaks Elementary. I'm in Troop 4577 and I've been a Girl Scout for four years. Please stay at the front of the room and we're going to take some pictures. And then once we've done that, then you and your families are free to leave because I know you have a very busy evening 
I'm sure getting ready for school tomorrow. So how would you like for us to do pictures? Do you want us to just back them up here or do you want to leave them there? So board members, do you have any comments you want to share with our scout friends who have joined us this evening? I, I would, if you don't mind. Go right ahead. So I, my, both of my kids are, are going to graduate this year, but they're both still in scouting. And I, I'll, just, I'll take a, just a quick minute to relay a story from our former governor, Perry. He met them in 2013, and what he told them was is that he hires or, or appoints hundreds of people a month as, as governor, right? And his staff has one director, and they get, they take all the resumes and they divide them up into two piles. And those two piles are the Eagle and Gold Award recipients and everyone else. And he hires from the first pile first. So my advice to you tonight is stay in scouting, finish your Eagle, finish your Gold. And when you're selling cookies, by the way, girls, come back and see me, okay? Yeah. So, thank you. And I buy popcorn too. <laughs> I'm a proud mom of an Eagle Scout and so um, I think that what words he just said to you are, are very important stick with it and sometimes you don't realize at this age how important it is but when your resume is on someone's desk looking for a, a position and they say oh Eagle Scout gets in front of me that's pretty significant so when you're grown up and out of college and trying to look for a job it's a very meaningful thing and I sit on the circle 10 exec board and so I kind of know um, <laughs> what takes place what what it takes to get these programs and you guys are in guys and girls are in great programs and really applaud you for being a scout and I want to say you know it's, it's great that you're in Cub Scouts and um, to praise the parents too because I know that it takes a lot of work, that parent involvement, for these kids to be in Cub Scouts. So thank you. Thank you, students, for joining us this evening. I know that you and your families are busy on a school night, and uh, we appreciate the service that you're providing to us and to the community. And enjoy your fellowship with one another and with your significant others that you know in your family that might be or spe special family friends that might be participating with you. Thank you for joining us, and you, you guys are free to head on out. It's nice to see all of this, the, everyone smiling when we have children here with us. So we continue with more recognition on the next part of our agenda. And Carla Oliver, the Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community, and Planning Initiatives, is made aware of student guests prior to the meeting. Do we have any additional student guests to recognize? We don't this evening. Right. Okay. That Thank was you. everyone. Thank you. Already this school year, our talented students are winning state, national, and international awards. The board is proud to recognize these talented students, sponsors, programs, and the dedicated teaching staff that guide our students to achieve the excellence for which our school district is known. Student names have been uh, plain before you on the PowerPoint in, in advance of our meeting. And we're proud this evening to commend our 124 National Merit semifinalists from Plano East, Plano, and Plano West Senior High Schools, and the Plano ISD Academy High School. Our science students, they got an early start winning awards. In July, at the International Genius Olympiad, our students won three gold and seven silver medals in international competition. And nationally, six middle school students from four Plano ISD middle schools were named in the Broadcom Masters Top 300. We even have a lot of uh, student performers who excel in the fine arts level at the national level. Our music programs have won 10 Mark of Excellence awards from the Foundation for Music Education. And we are sharing a board resolution with each director. 
And in September, a board resolution was shared with the Plano East Band Directors for the Earl D. Irons Program of Distinction Honor. In the visual arts, seven students won at the state level of the annual fire prevention poster contest. Congratulations to all of these students for their outstanding achievements and to the parents and to the teachers who led them. You can read about these achievements in detail on our website. Let's give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> We will now move to the regular public comment portion of our agenda. For the public comment portion of our agenda, the board has public comment cards that are accepted from 6 to 7 p.m. Cards are not accepted after 7 p.m. and are not transferable to other parties or speakers. All cards are collected and given to Carla Oliver or a representative of the communications department who will present the speakers at this time. Ms. Oliver, do we have any speakers for public comment? We do have two speaker cards. One is an agenda item and one is a non-agenda. Okay. All right. So pursuant to board policies, BED legal, BED local, and BED exhibit, the board may place reasonable restraints on the number, length, and frequency of presentations, so long as it does not unfairly discriminate among speakers based on their viewpoint. The board is not authorized to discuss or act on the public's comments or complaints if a subject is not on the agenda. If a member of the public or the board inquires about a subject for which notice has not been given, the board, the board may only make a statement of specific factual information, recite existing policy in response to the inquiry, or refer the person to a staff member for more information or assistance. If the subject of the public comment is already on the agenda for the meeting, the board may invite the speaker to stay until the board reaches that topic on the agenda. 30 minutes in total have been allotted to hear persons who desire to make comments to the board. Persons who wish to participate in this portion of the meeting shall complete the appropriate public comment form before the meeting begins and indicate the topic about which they wish to speak. No presentation shall exceed three minutes. If you're not finished speaking by the end of your three minutes, I will interrupt you so that we can move to the next person. Uh, delegations of more than five persons shall appoint one person to present their views before the board. Finally, pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.074, 551.0821, the board will not permit the presentation of personally identifiable information regarding the student and will not discuss the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee or to hear a complaint or charge against an officer or employee pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074. Should a speaker wish to address one of these issues, they must do so through the appropriate local grievance policies namely FNG Local, DGBA Local, or GF Local. Ms. Oliver, would you please call the yes. speaker to the podium? And then state your name and address, please. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn Mobius. My name is Carolyn Mobius, 1412 Parkview Lane in Murphy, Texas, and three minutes isn't long enough. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about um, the agenda item on concussions. So I wanted to share, some of you know, and some of you do not know that my child, and I'm gonna cry, so it's gonna take me longer. My, my daughter suffered a concussion on October 28, 2016. It's been the most difficult experience I've ever experienced, much more difficult than running for school board. This has been a very trying time for me, emotionally, to try and keep my child's spirits high and help her cope with this unfortunate accident. I have thankfully visited with many um, people here at PISD as well as um, trustees and um, teachers at our school um, from McMillan to Pesh. Uh, I am very excited to read about some of the um, steps forward that the group will be take or that PISD is going to take. One of my comments, will you please give me a minute warning? Whoever's gonna do Oh, good, I'm talking 15 minutes. Okay, my, one of the things I'm very grateful for is that it, there's going to be a concussion um, subcommittee. What I would like to encourage um, the subcommittee when they meet is that they reach out to Ben Hogan and ask them to please submit videos of students or children at different levels of um, recovery process. If I knew that my child would still be um, post-concussion syndrome at, to this date, I would have had them video her the whole time so 
that teachers, um, principals, 504 advocates, um, counselors, the whole myriad of people understand what is going on. You would be amazed at the progress that she has, um, that has progressed over this almost year. Um, I would also like to encourage that, that that subcommittee interview parents and students that have been through this, um, through concussions. Some people, re oh, crying. Okay. So the other thing I'd like to encourage is that you re review the homebound services. Homebound services, as it is set up, is really not appropriate for concussion um, students. They really, uh, there's, it's just very com um, confusing when you're at this part as a parent what to be pushing for and what not to be pushing for um, to have that good communication with the parents as well as with the 504 person. Uh, it's, there's not enough overlap. So I really encourage the group to please talk to parents and students who have been through this. Because um, I, I believe concussion short-term versus long-term versus health issues that are short-term versus health issues that are long-term, they all should have a different kind of um, protocol when homebound services are considered. You know, like streaming classes can be a potential thing because there's not homebound teachers that can teach Spanish 3, so my daughter had to drop that. So, and math and science are, are problems. Okay, that is not long enough. <laughs> it's nice seeing y'all. I'll be back at the end. Thank you very much. And we invite you to stay for the presentation of this topic shortly. Okay, we will now address the consent agenda, which includes personnel recommendation, minutes of previous meetings, bids, purchases, and construction items. Are there any requests to remove an item or items from the consent agenda for further discussion? Not for me. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Dr. Binkley, would you like to make an introduction? I really would. Thank you, President Bender. Uh, and we would like to welcome soon uh, to PISD, Mr. Randy McDowell, who will join us on November the 6th, I believe, uh, as he transitions into our next Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, so he'll get to work alongside Steve for just a little while. We welcome you, Mr. McDowell, to PISD, and we would invite you now to please stand and share with us your thoughts and invite any guests you brought with us. Sure. With, well, thank you very much. Before Ms. Bonzer has some comments that I know she wants to make, I always want to share with those who did come with you, thank you very much for being here. Uh, and, and beyond that, thank you for all the patience and the love it takes to, to help us, allow us to do the work that we do. So thank you uh, for being here this evening. So I just, I get the point of privilege to say, um, welcome to the team, uh, Randy, and, and it's so good to see the McDowell family here. Um, but. Yeah, I had the opportunity to work with Randy in the past, and I'm so excited that he's going to join the Plano team and the Plano family. And so uh, I also want to just express thanks to Rockwell ISD for being good neighbors and working with us to um, meet the start date that works best for Plano ISD because um, it sure does help our transition from Steve to, to Randy um, for Rockwall being so kind and generous with, with meeting timelines. And then in an effort to support your family one more time before you start the work, 
you don't have to stay for the meeting. Y'all should go eat dinner yeah. or something. <laughs> so you're free to go. And thank you for uh, you know, taking a chance on Plano ISD and joining the team. It's great to have you. Agenda. These are items for discussion and action, of which we have two. The first one is going to be related to Meadows Elementary and Dr. Dash Wersinga, our Senior Executive Director for Assessment, Research, and Program Administration, will present the Meadows Elementary Campus Improvement and Targeted Elements Plan for approval. Uh, as required by Texas Education Agency and Accountability Rules, we are required to send, present the Meadows Elementary Campus Improvement Plan and the Targeted Element Plan portion of it for board approval and before we submit it to TEA. So uh, we are presenting the, it's technically called the Targeted Elements Plan uh, for approval and I want to just mention a couple of things before I introduce uh, uh, Kathy Foster, uh, the principal at Meadows. This was, uh, there was a lot of work put into this, uh, mostly at the campus level, in case Kathy doesn't mention this. We started this process in uh, early August, and, and most probably we spent maybe 1,000 hours uh, or more on this at the campus involved, district staff, campus administrators, and almost each and every staff member at uh, at Meadows. So I will I want to let Kathy say a few words about how they went through the process. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to share the process that I, I guess the first thing I'd really like to, to say is thank you to Dash and our district staff because Meadows, um, we call it Team Meadows. Um, it's not just our staff working towards improvement, it's all of us. And, and that means a lot coming in new to know that there is a lot of support here in our district and they're just a phone call away so many of which are already on our campus a lot just supporting us as well so dash asked me just to share a little bit about the process that we've gone through since august um, beginning first with meeting peggy dickerson our psp who we are working with um, she came and joined us for a meeting on campus with district leadership as well to map out our steps in terms of improvement and how we wanted that to take place and a key component of that is that it's not just a group, a small group of people working together, but it's a collaboration between the district and the staff and, and her support and guidance. And so I'm very appreciative of that. Um, following that meeting, we all worked together to um, meet with, with all of our, our staff. And we felt like it was important for Peggy to be a part of that, to explain her role, to answer questions and to really just help people understand the process and so every grade level and every team met with her we spent a day doing that and then following that we um, picked up on our campus needs assessment and walking through what um, what does our data say where are our strengths and where are the areas that we want to improve and we spent an entire day with our leadership team from the campus um, teacher leaders um, administrative leaders counselors sel teachers and district staff and so we had representative from all content areas administration multilingual special education um, and student services just to make sure that we considered every aspect of student every aspect of student learning on our campus and so after a long day's worth of work and digging into the data and identifying areas um, one of the steps in the process is to identify problem statements that are areas you want to target for improvement and we were able to do that um, we met again after school one day to, can, to begin what um, we would call the root cause analysis process. Peggy was very instrumental in walking us through these steps and stages. Um, but not only did we want um, this team of leadership and district staff to be a part of that, we went back to our teacher teams and shared with them the process that we'd gone through and where we were to gather more input from the people who've been on our campus in terms of the why and where we are and why we think we're there. And then the next step being identifying root causes which are outlined in our plan and then the activities that we want to do to improve and to continue to move forward. 
Um, so those are outlined in the process and I hope that you're able to see that in our plan. Um, we had a principal's coffee this week where we shared this with, with our parents. I'd previously met with our PTA um, to make sure that they were aware of where we are and, and their importance in moving forward. Um, our parents were very receptive at our principal's coffee and very willing. Everyone said, you know what, I said, is this something we want to continue in terms of coming together? Um, donuts and coffee are a big hit, so um, we'll continue those. But the, the great thing about it was people said, we don't need the donuts and the coffee. We're going to come. And everyone agreed to bring someone else the next time. And I just think that's encouraging. And it was it was excited. I was just ready to, you know, it, it carries you through the next day and, and then those to come. And, and we also have met with our site-based improvement committee to review the plan, to make sure that we've covered all the aspects in which we want to continue to move forward. And then tomorrow we begin with our curriculum and instruction team. Lori's team is coming over. And one of our action items, we start tomorrow afternoon. And our staff is committed to improvement. Our staff is committed to our kids. And we don't want this to just be a one-time improvement, but it's something that, that some, we are committed to long-term in ensuring our students' success. So thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that. Thank you to the people who've supported us. Um, we're ready to go and excited to move forward. Questions? Yes, um, and I don't ask any of this as a criticism because I know both of you are new in these roles. It, it just grieves me when I look at a Plano school and I see that only 6% of the bilingual fifth graders pass the reading test. In Plano, that, that shouldn't happen. Um, I think as a board and as an administration, we've been slow to recognize some of our needs. I'm glad that we've sort of turned that corner. So the question I ask you, and, and please be brutally honest, is do you have the people resources to do this? Because these, these are just words on paper. If you don't have the people resources to make this happen, then it's hollow. So that's what I'd like to know. I really feel like we do. I think that the first step was just coming together and kind of determining the current reality in terms of our practices and our understanding. And then with our district support staff saying, where is it that we want to target our improvement? And bilingual is obviously, you can see, one of those areas. Um, I think bringing clarification to what our role and our desired outcome is, is really been what's critical. And the people are there. We have the staff, we have the people, and we have the district support. It's really about focusing what it is we want to do and then how we're going to measure our success along the way to know whether or not it's working. I really do feel like if for any reason we needed something, there is an open door into any office and we can ask. And I encourage you to do that because for too long in Plano also people, I think we're subtly told not to ask to the detriment of the students and, and we, just, we just can't have that. I also have a comment about always making sure we've aligned the curriculum, the teachers are actually teaching the curriculum. I have a friend who taught in a challenge school for years and so she taught fourth grade she would breeze through the fourth grade curriculum so she could keep her job in Plano and then she would teach the second grade curriculum that those children needed because even though they were fourth graders they were behind tremendously so I want us to recognize that children come to us from very different places they may be in fourth grade but if they haven't mastered second and third you might as well be teaching them in Greek and so I want to make sure that we also don't criticize hardworking teachers who are actually teaching what the kids need versus saying, oh, that's not aligned. So that, that's my plea as well. I would agree that you know our job is to meet our children where they are and then to take them to where they need to be. And, and doing that's not easy. If it was easy, I think everybody in the state of Texas would have figured this out. It's not, but it's, it's a commitment that we have and it's a realization that we have that when you have a standard here and we walk in here, how do you close that gap? And, and that's really what we're working on. What are the strategies that do that best? And when you look at a curriculum, you look at what those things are that kids need to know, but there are prerequisite skills that align and that are chunking information so that you can move forward more quickly and more effectively. And that's our job is to help teachers do that and to do it for not just one subject, but for all the subjects. And so I appreciate you recognizing the difficulty of that because it's not easy. Um, and that's what we're going to try and move forward to make sure there's support structures to have that happen. And we want to make you proud, Carolyn, because you actually helped bring forth a number of these challenges over the years as one of our fellow colleagues. <laughs> Carolyn is, but there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you, Kathy. Now, Dash, are you going to walk us through? Are you going to talk to us a little bit? If, if 
you want more detail, I can go through it, but uh, we can uh, move to a, uh, to a motion to pass. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. All right, so I will entertain a motion to approve the plan as presented. I move. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Uh, the second item for action today is the completion of our board advisory committee goals for the 17-18 school year. Uh, there are three goals we passed. We considered two for two committees last meeting or so, and then this is the uh, balance of three. Um, so let's talk about them one by one. First one is a career and technical education advisory committee. Um, there are two goals presented here. One is to explore opportunities to provide appropriate career pathways and community support for students with disabilities. And the second item is identify opportunities to teach coding from K to 12. Okay, any comments? Big hooray on the coding, way to go Yoram. I think that would really differentiate our students. It will allow us to start to bridge the divide between women and men in technical fields. If you start in kindergarten, then it's just something normal for children of both sexes to do. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we actualize this on our campuses. So I, I actually met with a few people that, uh, that deal with that. I, I was uh, somewhat uh, skeptical on the K part of it. Uh, you know, I can imagine you can start pretty early, but uh, I was assured that there are programs like this that starts at uh, kindergarten. Uh, programming is, is uh, I remember watching a TED talk at, at SMU a few years ago, and uh, there was a student there, a high school student, uh, and he had the video that, uh, the video that we recorded was about how everybody needs to st learn programming. And um, it just, it, it touched a chord. This is something that's important. And I think that if we look into the future, uh, that's going to be part of everybody's life. Okay, I have a couple of thoughts here. On that item, is the deliverable that we're looking for a list of opportunities by some grade ranges? A list of opportunities by what? By grade ranges. So if someone's studying K to 12, would you say, okay, for K to two, here's some options for three to five or whatever breakdown. Is that what we're looking for in a deliverable oh, by form? grade ranges. Whatever recommendation to cover K through 12. Okay. So I think that makes sense. There are probably best practices in other districts. There's yeah. different languages developed for different ages. And so I think okay. we could put together a robust plan for our children. Okay, so right here, I just want to get really clear about what we're asking yes. for. That's why I'm asking these questions. This says identify opportunities. Mm -hmm. So to me, opportunities is simply a list of language, programs, whatever is appropriate. Th that's a good point. Uh, I think we need to add uh, identify best practices as well. And maybe add one more thing, and that is we're not talking about COBOL. I know COBOL. That's okay. about it. You just dated yourself. Uh, yeah. All right. On the first item having to do with, uh, I'm, I presume, it's, it's opportunities for career. So it's mm -hmm. looking at career and technical education for students with disabilities. So on this note, I just made a comment to myself. I would just say, let's make sure that in the exploration of that, in the context of this committee, that they're collaborating with our special education staff and or parents in that process. So it's not just a group of people that don't have any exposure to that coming up with a list of things that might not even be appropriate. So that's actually how we started that, as collaboration. I think uh, we got some pushback from the special education advisory committee uh, that wanted to focus on the adult transitional program because we, we believe right. the exactly the same thing. It has to be collaboration. So to, to me, however, that collaboration makes sense. It can be mm -hmm. staff or other parents. Okay, so I just yeah. want to make that comment. Are you clarifying the language here then? 
for the. I'm not really clarifying the language. I'm just making a comment okay. for staff to. That's fine. Be, you know. The deal is, you know, these folks, they, you know, probably aren't staffed from that department. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to reach across the lines. And okay. That's all. That's fine. Okay. So, right. comment? Yeah, I've got uh, one more on the uh, the second goal, the identifying best practices or, or however we're going to word that. I would also maybe, as a subset of that, look for best practices to recruit students to those items because I think we mm -hmm. want to not just offer the opportunities, but what are the ways to get students actively engaged and involved in those opportunities? Or I would throw that, I would suggest that, throw that out there to the rest of the board, whether that's something that would be too broad for this category, I don't know. On the coding or on the special education? Yeah, on the coding. Not sure I fully. My hope some days it would be part of their curricular instruction. It wouldn't be something extra or special. It would be an after school program. Yeah. It, it would or would not? Would not. It would be part of the regular class Co day. Correct. But would it be, are you, are you thinking as a required component to all, for all students or as an optional component within the class day? And we're talking probably secondary more than K through 5, really. I think my, my wish would be from K through 8, it would be part of the required curriculum for all students. And then in secondary, for us to have a good pathway, a very robust pathway, of different computer science options for kids. But they come in with a great foundation. A lot of our kids, by the time we <coughs> expose them to computer programming, they're already behind their colleagues in other areas, kind of homegrown hackers. You, you know, I, I think that at some point, uh, <coughs> whether it's our state, uh, national, or any other state, would recognize that that is a core skill, a core capability, and will make it part of the core curriculum. Uh, the thing is, we can get ahead of it. Okay, so, so if what we're talking about then are best practices and opportunities to actually implement that into the curriculum for all students, I think that's something altogether different than what I was thinking, which would have been more of a career pathway at the secondary level and providing best practices to provide that opportunity. I, I don't have enough information about, I mean, I'm not expert in this, but um, so I, I don't have an opinion about whether it ought to be in the core curriculum or not. I'd like to just learn about opportunities mm -hmm. and best practices first. Yep. Before making a commitment, one right. thing, one way or another, because I'd like to hear staff weigh in on, you know, it, maybe that'll come in as a best practice that one should do that. Um, in terms of scope, and I don't know if David hit, is, is he here tonight? I know he's, nope. he will be leading this, but is this scope too broad? Is this too much for them to do, or is this okay to accomplish in? Uh, okay. I don't I hear an objection from David, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can add, yeah. we can add we, goals. We want to so. set this committee up for success. Sure. Right. I think as an advisory committee, they can certainly study, look at other districts, what's working in right. other places, mm -hmm. and bring lots of information together. I don't know that they're the committee that actually plans the implementation piece, right. so yeah. they can gather and make recommendations about all of these things you're just suggesting. Okay. Uh, last, last year we, uh, we had a pretty uh, deep discussion about the roles of advisory committees. We created a flowchart and uh, the definition and uh, definitely the word implementation should not be included yes. in what, even though it's led by a staff member who's in charge of CTE, right. uh, it's not within their scope to do anything with implementation. It's just to make recommendations to advise us what we should be doing. Right. Yeah. And another note, this, the coding for K through 12 would go beyond CTE. So I'm yeah. sure the committee will reach out to other staff members David and departments. And yeah. Okay, so it's explore opportunities to provide these pathways for students with disabilities. Item two is identify opportunities and best practices to teach mm -hmm. coding from K to 12. All right. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. That item passes. Thank you. Let's move to diversity advisory committee. The goal reads develop and implement a parental support program in support of the district's commitment to equity program that is working to reduce student opportunity gaps. Yes. Comment <laughs> one, we should strike yeah, so I was gonna say and implement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, any other dialogue on that item? 
Well, do we want to say rather than implement, specifically say and recommend? I mean, that's the idea is that we're mm -hmm. the, we're asking them to do the work to actually yep. recommend to us. I, I mean, I think didn't one didn't one get developed already? Uh, well, the feedback that we received, if I remember correctly, is that they wanted to continue and work on this. They felt that they were not done. Okay, so continue to develop. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's fair. So that when we're looking back at this in years, okay, forward, we can know it was a second. So can we year. add that? Continue to develop mm -hmm. a parental support program. Okay. okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve as presented. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Last item, Special Education Advisory Committee. The goal reads as such. Research outstanding adult transitional programs and recommend a plan of action to develop growing opportunities for our students for the new Adult Transition Center. Are we okay with the language from a staff point of view to research and recommend a plan of action? Very welcome. Okay, any other comments? I'll entertain a motion to approve as presented. So move. Second, please. Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Those items are complete. We had no items pulled from the consent agenda, so we will now move to reports. Item nine. Uh, item A is the School Health Advisory Council report. And I invite Dr. Katrina Hasley, Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services, to introduce the report regarding the 2016-17 SHAC recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Bender. Brian McCord, our PE and Health Coordinator, along with Megan Schuler, our Director of District Health, we're in this committee, they lead this committee together. And so tonight, Brian McCord will be presenting the recommendations from last year's work. And I think this will be a little different than the usual reports because some time has passed and some of these things are already in the implementation phase. So he's included those little bits of information in his report. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Good evening, President Bender, Board of Trustees, Dr. Bingley, Ms. Bonzer, and members of the Cabinet. I would like to start off by thanking Dr. Cooper, Gerald Brents in the Athletic Department, Janet Hancock, Student and Family Services, Dr. Hasley and Megan Schuler in helping with the gathering and organization of the following information. Tonight I'm presenting the 2016-2017 School Health Advisory Council's work and recommendations. Because this presentation was postponed until October for further subcommittee work, many of the items being presented are currently being implemented. You should have received a copy of a more detailed report from the SHAC's work and recommendations. The following PowerPoint is an overview of that work. The School Health Advisory Council has many responsibilities, but the main purpose of the committee is to ensure the local community values are reflected in our health education. Some of the work from the SHAC committee over the 2016-2017 year included a revision of our local wellness policy, the review of supplemental curricular programs, and our 2016-2017 board advisory committee goals. Our first goal was to review studies related to contributors to su suicide, identify best practices in suicide prevention, and recommend actions for the district to take. The committee heard from the following programs on the topic of mental health and suicide prevention. We heard from our own guidance and counseling department covering our current practice. We heard from Benita Halliburton from the Grant Halliburton Foundation which has a number of programs aimed at teaching people how to recognize the signs of distress or suicidal crisis in a young person and how to lead them to help. We heard from a representative from the Suicide and Crisis Center of North Texas, specifically discussing mental health screening. We heard from Dr. Jennifer Hughes from UT Southwestern concerning um, the U Youth Aware of Mental Health or YAM program. YAM is a universal evidence-based mental health promotion program we also heard from Plano ISD's Social Emotional Learning Advisory Committee. The charge of the committee is as follows. In Plano ISD, we will grow to understand and manage emotions, care for self and others, develop empathy, build resiliency, and solve problems effectively and ethically. Social Emotional Learning will empower students to become responsible, productive, and contributing members of a global community. 
So our first step was identifying these practices. Um, so current practices during 2016-2017 school year included mandatory suicide prevention training for all campus staff with follow-up training by counselors, counselor training related to mental health and suicide prevention throughout the school year, parent education offered across the district, secondary guidance curriculum related to self-care and prevention of self-harm and suicide, elementary guidance lessons related to personal safety, problem solving, self-management, and steps to take when assisting when assistance is needed, and then TEKS that address mental and health, mental health and suicide are reflected in our health curriculum. The following slides represent the 1617 recommendations in any current implementation. The color highlighted represents a specific group. For example, this first slide is focused on our students. Based on Based on PIC's current practices, there was a recommendation for a revision and expansion of our K-12 counseling curriculum. Currently, all counselors are presenting a revised curriculum over mental health and suicide prevention to their students, and the introduction of PACT, which is Plano Acknowledges, Cares, and Tells, and that's being distributed across to all students, not just 612. Sixteen, seventeen recommendations regarding the SAFE program from Grant Halliburton. Um, so we get a little more colorful here. Um, we have two different presentations, the SAFE for students and then the presentation specifically for adults, which would include both parents and teachers or counselors. Um, so the recommendations are to continue with professional staff presentations and training continue district-wide parent meetings and expand the program to include classroom presentations. The current 17-18 implementations include safe presentations presented to all counselors and secondary health and physical education teachers. Three parent meetings are scheduled for this fall. And then the safe presentation has been approved for any campus to use with their students. The 16-17 recommendations for YAM was to pilot two campus beginning in the fall of 2017. Um, the current implementation is that we are currently working with UT Southwestern and implementing, um, we're setting the process up of including these, this program in all health classes, 9 through 12. What are the campuses that we have the pilot in now? Um, we never did pilot. We went right to, we thought staffing wise we'd need a pilot, but after realizing that they had the staff to go ahead and include it into all of our campuses, we moved forward with it. In regards to social emotional learning, the 16-17 recommendation was to continue to expand strategies to all schools. Um, the 17-18 implementations include all campuses implementing SEL strategies um, with their teachers and students. After research, the areas that stand out include the continuing of education of students, staff, and parents, and be, being aware of signs and symptoms of mental health, suicidal behaviors, and getting those individuals to the appropriate health. The committee's additional recommendations are to enhance parent awareness of mental health issues and increase resources that are available through the school and community, provide ongoing training and resources for counselors and staff related to mental health issues, and research a district-wide student safety reporting procedure system and educate students on the use of the system, which reflects one of our 17-18 goals. Right. Moving on to our... Brian, can I ask you a question? Yes, absolutely. On that previous slide, please. Yes. The pink item for yes. students to provide training for staff, so about mental health issues. Will students know through this process, like where to go? Like let's say someone recognizes in someone else or a person self-recognizes right. I'm, I'm having an issue I need help with. Will they know what to do? Yes, I think next? that was a big part of the revised curriculum from Jana's group was to, part of that curriculum was to really focus on providing an adult 
or having that student identify a doll in their life that they felt comfortable going to, it was a teacher, a parent. And then um, part of that too was really focused on having students be advocates for each other. And that student that's going through those problems or showing those symptoms might, might, not, might not reach out, but hopefully the friend they're talking to will reach out for them. So on that same topic, yes. it talks about a reporting system. Is Correct. there an anonymous reporting? Or how, how is that, system, what is the system? Is it online or? That's, what, that's the work we're gonna be doing this year. Okay. It's really just okay. researching what, what options are out there. Okay. So, so can I ask a clarifying point yes, on absolutely. this question? So is the idea that these students know that they can go to a trusted teacher or counselor or is there a, is it, or, you know, is it identified with the campus of, hey, if you are in, having these problems or if you have a friend who's having these problems, here is the person that you need to talk to. Both. Um, I think with the SEL work too, you know, that work is really focused on having all students and all staff present this kind of um, welcoming demeanor in, in classroom where the students, you know, start to feel more comfortable expressing these concerns that they might have. Well, and just to, to add to what Brian is saying, we actually pulled a committee of counselors together this past summer. We read a lot of the uh, information about current programs that are out there um, and best practices in terms of curriculum that would, that would help prevent suicide, any kind of self-harm. Um, and pardon my voice, I think I have the same allergies. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, uh, what we came up with was a lesson that not only included the, the signs and symptoms that you should be aware of if you or a friend is, is at risk or experiencing some difficulty. Um, but, but what we know and, and also what we've read is that our students are our, our best defense. You know, because as much as we like to think they're coming to us and sharing everything with us, they tell their friends first. So one of the crucial parts of these lessons is information about what do I do if I'm at school and a friend needs help or if I need help? And what do I do when I'm not at school? So we really feel like we've equipped them with that information about who to call, what to do, when it's okay to dial 911. And, and what we're really seeing already is that our kids understand this. It's a simple message. The, the PACT acronym is really um, resonating with them, as in I acknowledge that, that this is a serious issue I let my friend know that I care, and then I go and tell someone that I can trust and that can help me. We're not asking our students to diagnose anything or assess risk. We just want them to know what to do. And we've already seen evidence that they're uh, understanding that. So that's what's really exciting for us. We've also, along with the work of the Social Emotional Learning Committee, um, we've built in some self-management, stress relief kind of, kinds of activities, six through 12. And, and uh, our elementary curriculum already is um, kind of incorporates some of these things, but we're adding to that with the guidance lessons that the elementary counselors are doing. So we're, we're very excited about the curriculum that we're presenting, and we're also excited that counselors have made a really, um, uh, or, or they've, they've intentionally gone in to meet with their students. It's not um, a situation where this counselor takes that classroom and this counselor takes the other classroom. They've been meeting with their group of students. So especially with the, the way we're structured, I think it's so important that a ninth grader will meet their counselor in the first two weeks of school. Same for a, an 11th grader. So, and we're already seeing evidence that that's, that's such an important connection. And these kids know exactly where to go. And I'll just brag on Williams, I don't know if they're here, but they have this um, big area in their counseling office. And so they didn't go to the students. They broke the students in groups and brought them into their offices to deliver this curriculum. Because they said, we want them to know exactly where to go. So exciting things are happening with the curriculum. And our plan going forward is to expand it. Um, we're doing a, a survey that we have students uh, responding to at the end so that we'll know which elements we want to build on, add more information, or, or whatever else it is that they need at this point. So is this getting to 100% of our students? Yes. Our special program center is, is um, doing these same mm -hmm. lessons, so yes. I guess 
I have a question about a previous slide if we're opening up questions, but the Grant Halliburton Foundation, um, we talk about continuing district-wide parent meetings. Mm -hmm. So how are we um, getting parents involved? We have uh, been promoting that through the campuses. Um, it's also on the website. It's, it's difficult, as you know, to get large groups of parents to come in the evenings. We also have some PTAs that have done similar programs, either with Halliburton or other groups. So that, that's what we've been doing is website, e-news. I sent it out to all the principals today so that they can uh, remind their parents again. Before we go on to goal two, I, I just really want to give a shout out to the work in the social emotional uh, efforts that, that we've put in and, and along with those, some good restorative practices that our teachers have, have really embraced. And I know we're, we're really focusing here a lot on, on wellness and, and so forth, uh, but in, in talking with Mark, look, I'll make you wake up out there, Mark. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, our, our, our suspensions have gone down two years in a row. Uh, the state requires us to report uh, discretionary alternative education placements, which is almost always people didn't get along with somebody somehow in a, in a most egregious way. Those have gone down dramatically, uh, including gap reduction for some of our, our subgroups. And, you know, when our teachers were asked, uh, the, the biggest gain, I think, on our teacher uh, question, question was that our kids are good at accepting their peers and seeing things from others' points of view. That went up to like 93%. And our secondary kids themselves said, yeah, I think I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> they, they said 90%. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the antidote for bullying isn't really anti-bullying programs, it's empathy, mm -hmm. right? And I just think we have really done uh, a, a very credible job in trying to bring this, and, and then it comes full circle, right back to the conversation we're having here, when we're, when we're facing those issues of bullying and we're, we're helping people interact with each other in ways that are, are far more healthy. Uh, I just thank everybody for, for their involvement in that work, and in the end, I don't know that we could fully measure how, how valuable that is. Thank you, Jana. Okay. okay, moving on to goal two. Um, the goal two was to review findings from concussion research, identify best practices in concussion prevention, identification, return to play, return to learn, and recommend any changes to district practice. We start our work by have an athletic department come in and present current district practices, which included coaching safe tackling techniques, concussion training for all coaches, employment of full-time trainers, gathering district data related to sports-related concussions, baseline testing offered to athletes, trial of helmet protectors for Plano Senior High for Senior High football practice, use of UIL return to play protocol, and use of additional contracted trainers for JV and middle school games. A concussion subcommittee was formed to gain further research. The subcommittee heard from five different medical professionals and experts in the field of concussions, and the, the committee also surveyed surrounding districts on concussion practices. The following recommendations were brought forward and voted on by the SHAC. The coloring represents items that are recommended to happen prior to concussion are in purple, and items recommended to happen after a Concussion has, been, concussion has been diagnosed are in green. So our recommendations are additional athletic trainers for high school campuses, district-wide return to learn procedure, concussion education for coaches, nurses, teachers, parents, and students, the helmet reconditioning replacement to include um, middle schools, Coordination, coordination of District Concussion Oversight Committee to meet yearly. Institute mandatory baseline testing for all athletes. And then baseline testing availability for all incoming seventh graders. 
Current implementation includes six additional athletic trainers for high school campuses for our 910 campuses, a district-wide return to learn procedure, and then concussion education for coaches, nurses, teachers, parents, and students. And that concludes this piece. So I've got two comments. Yes. One, as a dad of a 10th grade football player, I'm extraordinarily happy to see the mandatory baseline testing. I think it's, it was optional up to this point, so Correct. I like that. Now, the other issue is I think probably more tied to this district-wide return to learn procedure and probably frankly goes to you know Carolyn's comments earlier. Um, I've got another friend whose child had a fairly a serious concussion and it took her a year and a half to, to get back. And so what I'd ask is um, in terms of certainly there, we want to prevent concussions from ever happening and that's a lot of the work that y'all have done and a lot of what you've already done um, but we also need to really focus on what happens after Absolutely. Um, and getting those students this return to learn um, being more than a UIL return to play protocol mm -hmm. but something right. that's much deeper than that right. well David uh, I'll, I'll just I know you were absent at our last work session but dr. Cooper gave us a very good explanation of what they're doing with um, coaches nurses nurses teachers parents and students trying to make certain that when the student has a broken arm people make accommodations for that student somebody carries his or her books but when somebody has a concussion it's not a visible disability and sometimes the concussions happen outside of school athletics or it could happen you know off campus so they've got a protocol and you can speak about it much better than I can but <laughs> whenever um, the student presents that problem they're alerted they're they've got key words that they listen for and then they make those accommodations so I feel very proud of the work that the shack has done to get us where we are in this protocol and feel free to fill in if I missed out uh, Mr. Stolle, I think the, and you did do a good job, uh, Ms. Humphrey. The, the process in a Reader's Digest version is there, there's some things that are already in play on the campus with, uh, that she made reference to when kids uh, come, to, come to school, regardless of their injury. Uh, but what we want to do is strengthen that awareness with the concussion, that invisible injury, so that when it is apparent and in, that's diagnosed, that certain people on campus, they are made aware of that so that the dominoes can start to fall and then the things can be put in place for that student to uh, whatever accommodations need to, need to take place in individually, because they're, they're all gonna be different uh, based upon the grade of the concussion and the, the significance and, and those kind of things, and then the class schedule in, as well. So those things are uh, going on and we'll continue to monitor that as we go throughout the year and make some adjustments as we need to and we'll also pay attention to what's going on in uh, in other places uh, best practices and, and see what we need to do to modify here but we I think things are from what I hear uh, from both the the groups of um, principals the, some teacher teachers on campus different variety of people have made some comments that this is uh, just having kind of a more streamlined process is is, is helpful can I ask a clarifying question on, yes. on uh, my colleague's first point there? Have we instituted mandatory baseline testing for all athletes? Because I thought we had not. We, are, we just did. We at, just at did. A couple of meetings. Well, we. Because I thought we provided it as an option. provided the contract. Correct. Well, right. What we do, we, we have a vendor, that, and, and once again, a reminder, we have offered it, but what we want to do is we want to offer it during the school day and pay for it right. so that it is. It, it, I don't want to say captive audience, but we, it's much more easier and we can get full participation right. when, uh, when we do that. So I think there, there, there probably does need to be a little more conversation if, if y'all want to lean uh, toward and go in the direction of, of the mandatory piece, because that is, that is going to be a little different because that's something that's not required right. by the UIL. Um, so that's just something to consider. Well, I've just made a note on that line item for all athletes. I also wrote, and others if desired. Like, there are students that 
may participate in other activities that may wish to have a baseline, right. I'm willing to pay for that. I don't want to just say, well, it's only going to happen to athletes because we know that it doesn't. We know Correct. what happens to others too, and not always, uh, it, on our premise it can happen, on our properties. So we're talking about a $2 cost. If there are others who would like to participate in a voluntary manner, I, I like the idea of doing it on campus during the school day. I don't think we can make students mm -hmm. submit to it if the parent opts out. But I'd like to make it just personally available to all who are who want to have it. And if it's in a PE class or an athletics class or whatever, but if there are other classes, if there are other students that want it, I, I want to give it to them too. I think that's where we are now. Is that right, Dr. Cooper? Is that is it? It's, it's only available optionally to athletes right now. Is that correct? Athletes, cheerleaders. Okay. Now I think there are there have been. Uh, situations where other students do have have come to these these testing uh, opportunities that have happened previously and they're not turned away it's but there's just not a there's, there's not many no formal, uh, but a difference is we haven't paid for it in the past right yeah. I, I and think I, clarification well, is important and I appreciate yeah. Greg bringing yeah. this up I I was under the understanding that it was now mandatory for all athletes and cheerleaders and we said that we wanted to pay for it I don't know if we ever voted on that I'd like to see what the implementation plan is because I want to make sure all of those children are tested and if others wish to, whether it's drill team, because you can usually take a tumble in there, whoever else, I think we should be supported for that. Well, let, yeah, let's talk about the timing and, uh, of the implementation because as of last, you know, May was when they did the baseline testing for at least for football players at Shepton. So that's what I have personal knowledge of. If, you know, if it is the idea that at this point we will implement a mandatory testing if we have this conversation we all agree yeah we want mandatory testing that'll be implemented this year in the spring for next year correct yeah okay and then we'll have a catch-up uh, make up catch up another opportunity in the summer for students that move into the district or were absent want to change their mind want to participate and we'll, we would have one of those in the summer but we what we'll do is uh, and I'll, we've already visited um, Brian and Megan, Coach Brantz, and a couple others that will we'll spend the coming, the, the coming months and, and plan. We'll also involve the principals because this is going to be, we're going to need to be utilizing those uh, computer labs and some space on campus. So we're going to have to coordinate some things as well as, as we go on the campus during the regular school day. And I don't think it's going to be any problem, but we need some time to get that, get that planned out and all the logistics lined up and with the testing vendor so that we're coordinating schedules as well. And then the communication part so we can make sure that parents are aware, back to the other, um, the students that don't participate in campus programs, but they obviously, as, as Ms. Benders pointed out, the, you know, the club soccer, the competitive cheer, the XYZ activities that they're involved with that are not not school related but they they're on, on our campus I'd, I'd like to see this sooner and later we've already missed volleyball and football seems like the, the football players might have already been baseline last year volleyball probably wasn't and basketball <coughs> season is upon us I don't want to miss all the basketball season without having tested and that's also a smaller number of children so I wouldn't want any more sporting seasons to start for this year with children not having that baseline I question how we can make it mandatory if um, would we have to have a, a requirement from that activity and then the parent could opt out I'm not sure mechanically how no, that we, works. we would have to look we'd have to look into that as far as adding additional uh, requirements onto an activity we I mean it's it's simply answering a couple of questions on the computer is that right is I mean the baseline testing it's I believe it's about Coach Branson about 25, 30 minutes a piece. 45 minutes. Yeah. 45 minutes oh. for one person. But okay. when we're cycling them through in uh, in, an, in a lab or multiple labs at the same time, we can. Mm -hmm. We require physical exams that parents have to pay for, so I don't see why we well, can't require we, this. We don't require that. The UIL requires that. Mm -hmm. But like state testing, that's required. 
but they submit to it or they don't show up. I, I think we're just questioning, can we make it mandatory? That's the question right. on the table. Right. Yeah. So We can look into that. Let's just find out from our attorney what, you know, what an opinion is on that. Okay. We obviously don't know. <laughs> but <coughs> if it could be, is there interest in making it? There is for me. There's interest for me. I just okay. want to know what the implications are. Even if, it's, if we can't make it mandatory, I'm extremely interested in making it strongly encouraged and time during the day set uh -huh. aside to do it on campus um, so that there's availability and I'm also interested in paying for that to make sure that yeah. anybody who wants it mm -hmm. has the time and the opportunity and availability to do it. So I, I agree with everything that David said uh, to make it uh, n short of mandatory, make it available, make it easy. Uh, the default is that you take it, but to give the option to opt out. Mm -hmm. So you, okay. you have to be proactive to opt out. I mean, I suspect legally we can't yeah. make it mandatory, yeah. but Probably. will that well, wouldn't it be sort of like going on a field that. trip? Yeah. We're going on a field trip. Here's your parent permission. Or we're going, or or we're going to teach this. If you don't want to learn it, you can sign a permission a mm -hmm. slip that says I'm not going to be present, or my I have a problem with it. The parent still has the ability to do that. Or if they don't want to read a certain curriculum, certain book. They get a different book. Also, I'd like to understand what we all think about basketball season because actually three deaths due to concussion occurred in this district due to basketball. I would not want another season to go by without baseline those children. Well, I think probably from, I, I'm all for getting this implemented as soon as possible. I think the question then would be for Carrie and Gerald is how quickly could we set something like that as a, you know, is there an opportunity to do a, a, a fall testing um, for, you know, certain, maybe make it you know optional for whatever students but offer it during the day in the fall and then in the spring have a more robust program for the following school year I mean that's an option yeah we can we can get with the vendor and see what we can uh, facilitate with them if we could do something like in December you know that would cover all of the spring sports and activities and then again in May for the following year perhaps that's an option so if you could investigate and let us know what you discover that would be great from the mandatory from, piece from the, and the op from the mandatory piece okay what are, what are the particulars around that number one and number two um, is it possible to do a two-step right. phase in um, so that we capture students as soon as possible who are engaged in these activities this year well it may improve logistics going forward to do a two-step because then you've got the students that are mm -hmm. in the I mean, fall you may they may not be all new. Like right. the ones in the fall may be covered, and you don't need to do them in the spring. I right. don't know. You've mul you're multi multi sport students. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. multi activities. Mm -hmm. okay. Also, is it possible to send to us as board members the written information that goes to parents? I'm just curious about what we're sending to our parents. Well, we don't have it yet because we're. We're going to make it. We didn't plan on implementing it until the spring. Okay. When you've got it, I'd love to see it. Okay. Um, on the parent question, on the return to learn. So leaving the prevention, now we have a, an incident and we're doing the return to learn. Uh, and, and this might be something that's not yet developed, so that's okay. In, so child comes, presents information we've identified. We're assigning them a 504 counselor and a plan is developed now mom and dad or you know grandparent is at home unfamiliar with this new territory do we have a process flowchart or a document that goes home with the parent to say I know this has just happened I want you to know what we're doing and this is what you can be doing just so they kind of know here's where I am in the process and here's what's coming and kind of where they fit and they sort of know what to look for because this is all new and they're just going to be I'm sure the whole family is in shock do we have something like that developed or are we going to develop something the way we understand the process is 
a student would go to, um, for example, Ben Hogan, they would meet with a medical professional. That professional would send them to school, contact the school, you know, with a list of accommodations, um, depending on the severity of the concussion. And then we have it set up on campus where we have go-to people who are aware of, uh, of the concussion protocol, the return to learn protocol. And then, depending on the severity of it, it might be communication from the counselor to the teacher. Uh, here's what they experienced. Here are the accommodations. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question. So I'm looking for what does the parent get? Anything? Does the parent have visibility of the outcome of that resolution? I know Dr. Sands know they right. put together a plan right. to they, provide they should, they should be, and, and this gets back to the folding the concussion injury and identification into the current practices that already goes, it takes place on a campus on a, on a very routine basis with the, the, a variety of other injuries. And it gets back to the commit because they, they might not necessarily immediately go to the 504 route. Uh, so that campus, the intervention team, they will get together of which the parent would be immediately, should be immediately involved in, in the process. And then those conversations should happen because it's, once again, it's going to be different for each, um, each student. But so the communication part back to the parent should be um, happen at, on pretty early on in the, on the campus. I guess I'm still not getting an answer. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? More parent information. More parent I'm information up signs front. And so symptoms and yeah, this is what you're experiencing. I want them to understand that we understand where they're where, what they're dealing with, and I want to give you confidence, parent, that we got this, and this is what we're doing, and this is what you can be doing. And if there's a problem, here's who you can call. I think that at some point we have to defer to the doctor. We we can't take on the role that the parent thinks we're I being get that. the doctor. But I know in Carolyn's situation, she had to do, as an informed parent, there were many things that she, she knows people, but even she stumbled figuring out who do I call for what and this doesn't work and what am I supposed to do? That's frustrating, that's upsetting to the whole family. And we can do a better job at laying out the whole process, I think. Maybe such a process exists for ARD meetings and such. I don't, I, I, I don't know if that's documented in the same way. I'm just asking for more parental process flow information. Yeah. My, my suggestion would be to, as we walk away from this meeting, to get with Brian and Megan, uh, Jana's group, and probably some other departments as needed that need to be involved and have a conversation and and, and you know and Carol suggested something. talking with parents who've been through this reach out to some reach out to some kids and say could could you help us make this better what did you not know that you would have liked to have known to make it better for the next person and right. I know we're obsessing about this and I'm sorry but um, it's for a lot of reasons important to uh, get this right and, and let me just say I really appreciate all of the time that you have spent Carrie on this and Gerald and Megan and Brian you've done you've listened you've reflected and you've acted and I really we really appreciate that we're, we're just going to continue to get better at this um, yeah, something else that we can do is even reach out to the parents and students that have um, had a concussion related issue recently as, as these new uh, stronger processes have been in place and say, what, what are your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and not just right. you know, from a previous standpoint. Absolutely. And I, I would actually expand that out to beyond concussion. I think any, we've got you know, any student who has an injury that keeps them out of the classroom for an extended period of time, let's reach out to them and their parents and, and ask, how can we get better at this? It's because it happens more often than you, know, than you would think. And so that's something that you know, just asking, I think we might be able to glean some new information on how we could do things and improve our process. 
This is an area that I also want Plano to be world class, best in class in terms of how we help these children return to the classroom successfully and return to learn. So I want us to set the standard. And please don't take this as us being critical. We're just interested. <laughs> and so we ask a lot of questions because I know you care and we care a lot too. So we want to support you making it as awesome as we can possibly make it and protect our kids as much as we possibly can. So this is us supporting you. <laughs> Wait until we object. <laughs> No, it's good. Thank you. Yes, appreciate the feedback. Thank you. More than you probably bargained for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have anything else? I don't know. Share? <laughs> Does anybody else have anything else? Uh, okay. I think uh, since we're uh, talking about the uh, the advisory committee, this advisory committee, and others, one of the ideas that came up is to actually at the end of the work of every advisory committee, ask them to uh, propose goals for the next year as a starting point for us doing the work that we have done today. So we've got to document some of those things. We're going to improve mm -hmm. this process even further. Of the, uh, and we appreciate all of you that have been involved in this kind of work, being patient with us as we make it better and improve our role in that. And what Yarm is explaining that is that help us make better goals for you by making some suggestions at the end of the year. Okay. So we did not give you that request this time, but um, all for, of you for, who, for the next year. Yes. For the com coming months, come and, and we'll you know get that information out. But that's some of what, you know, some conversation right. that Absolutely. we've had. Well, and also, um, like on the previous goals that we adopted, this year one was a continuance so that's okay sometimes right. we need to go further yes. deep Absolutely. into a subject area so that's yes. fine so again thank you for working over the summer reaching um, out to all the experts that all of you reached out to the implementations that you've already put into place I appreciate all Absolutely. of it thank you thank you okay one more report is item B, the instructional calendar update for 2018-19. Carla Oliver will provide a report regarding input received for the 2018-19 calendar drafts that were previously presented at the September board meeting. Ms. Oliver. Thank you, President Bender. Um, just to open our conversation this evening and for the members of our audience, last time we presented two different calendars as a starting point for the board to uh, adopt as an academic calendar for the calendar jump for us, which is part of the process itself. That was the, the uh, purpose. And so with that, I will say, um, um, I'll give you a couple of updates. You received a report in your packet that gave some uh, survey breakout information. And we're very pleased about uh, the responses. And we checked it just before coming into the room this evening, before our meeting essentially started. It's been a while now. Um, but right now we're sitting at 4,091 responses. It changed actually while we were pulling information down, so it's already obsolete, <laughs> my report is. Um, but that gives you an update about how many people have responded. Um, I do have some calendar quick facts that I can go through as far as some of the responses that we've received. Um, I hesitate to make assumptions, but with there are some emerging trends, obviously. Um, uh, we did include, just as one tool, we. Uh, when we were about 500 responses in, we did a word cloud of some of the information coming in to start to see what was showing up and what were some of the trends. That information has been pretty consistent despite the fact that that's not been run again. We see that it's very uh, consistent. We'll probably do that again this month. Um, so we're just midway. Uh, we do plan, if you remember our process, we're going to certain groups and providing access to the survey according to the timeline. Right now we're on track with that with one exception, one meeting that was um, uh, to be held in September was delayed until October and so we'll be meeting that so that was a little bit of change on that timeline but other than that we're on track um, with the survey results that you have in your packet um, again not to make too many assumptions that's a big word for me this evening because you can make a lot of assumptions based on things that you receive in a survey and I certainly don't want to assume on behalf of the board 
But I will say, given the notion of some trends that are coming in, and you've heard me say this probably every year, for those of you that are new to the board, you're going to hear this next year, I'm sure, is that preferences that come in, and truly they are preferences. If you remember, the survey serves the purpose of bringing input into our district, not voting for a calendar, but just absolutely saying this is what works for our family or this is a preference that we might have. Um, so very quickly, I, I think I can remember these very easily, but most people want to start after Labor Day. They do want a fall break. Um, they do want a week at Thanksgiving. They want the full time for winter break. And I'm, I'm not saying this facetiously. It, it truly comes in this way. Um, there are different ideas about when and uh, how spring break should be hosted, but definitely a week at spring break. Um, we want to wrap up before Memorial Day. Um, and all those, I will tell you, are mathematically impossible <laughs> right now. Um, and I respect every one of those opinions. But with our transportation schedule that we have, we've had a lot of creative um, comments that came forward of wouldn't you consider this, wouldn't you consider that, and the notion is yes, we would, if we could. Uh, right now, but some of those are just simply not an option. So again, not to take anything that you're considering off of your, your plate, this is all very familiar to you as well. Um, I will share um, a couple things that I thought was very interesting. By using different uh, collection and links, uh, we know that 1,176 of the survey takers uh, connected to the survey via the link provided on our website. 2,352 connected via social media, which would be either our Facebook or Twitter, um, and 578 connected via a link shared in our electronic news, our e-newsletter. Um, let's see where I want to go from there. Um, I, again, I have a, a lot that I could go through. I don't know that it's necessary unless you have specific questions. I will say, based on the comments that we were receiving, I did put together a draft that you've seen that could be in response to some of the trends that are emerging. Um, I'll look to you for your direction if you can see that viable option or if you would rather not do that. But we would also, whatever comes as a result of this meeting, if there's anything different than the, than the A or B, then we certainly would like to have the opportunity for um, community input and staff input as well. Just a clarifying question. You said there's an alternate you're, you were proposing based on feedback you're giving. Is that C, what we're seeing? Correct. Okay, just to clarify. Thank you. Can you, I, I should assume again, um, can you talk us through it a little bit? I will. So if, um, again, for the calendars that you've already been looking at for the last month, uh, draft A um, has a total of 177 days of instruction. And that would be split by an 8790 for first and second semester for dates. Draft B, that was also a consideration or still is on the survey. Um, first semester, 85 days, and the second semester would be 92. And then coming into this next calendar, and I, I will say too, I should have mentioned this first, not just based on the number of days, but calendar A also focused on a start date of Monday, August the 13th. And draft B started um, Wednesday, August the 15th. That brings a lot of commentary as well <laughs> um, among our survey takers. Um, draft C could be considered another option depending on how you would like to manage this process. Um, I did note a start date of the 15th to be considered. Um, if you'll look in October, there are extra days in there that could be considered a fall break. It wraps around a weekend but it would be more days than on our current calendar and would bring a fall break to those who have had that outcry for quite some time. Then if you notice, there's still a week in November for Thanksgiving. And the 19th that's, uh, that's in orange on your calendar, that's actually a flex day of learning for teachers. We don't expect them to be at work that day, but they would get credit for having done their professional learning. Um, then you'll see the winter break depicted very traditionally. And then if you'll jump to May, students would come back that week of Memorial Day, but end on that Friday. So a question about the flex day, how will a teacher prove he or she has actually done their professional learning on that day, or do we don't, we don't expect them to do anything? No, I wouldn't say that we don't expect them to do anything. I'd, I'd like to ask for someone, Susan, if you'll speak up. Thanks. They wouldn't do it on that day. They have opportunities throughout the summer and during the year to um, collect 
the hours toward that day. Is that done in other districts? I don't think we've mm -hmm. ever done that. No. Yeah, we're doing it yeah. currently. Yeah, and we track it in my learning plan, correct? I mean, so it's... So they buy themselves days in the summer, do, do a little bit, okay. So what's the breakdown of instructional days in uh, option C, C, fall and spring? Uh, fall would be 83 days, and the second would be 94. It, when we talk about balanced semesters, we've had uh, lengthy conversations about that, not only in board meetings, but also among our cabinet and our departments, which we have had uh, interdepartmental meetings about what different graphs versus uh, from student records to financial services to our department to what the board would be considering. The professional learning certainly uh, wrapped around with employee services about teachers and their learning and how they would report. So all that's going on as well. So this is based on three waiver days, is that what we Correct. have now? Each of the drafts that you're looking at would be 177 days. Carla, is, oh, sorry. is 177, the, the, we have three waiver days this year too? Right. Carla, when, when we, um, a couple of comments. One, when we, when we think about the number of instructional days mm -hmm. for the spring, can we factor in, subtract out mandatory testing days? Yes. Um, <coughs> to thank you to Batch for stepping forward and bringing some calendars that we could look at. And, and I will begin to say that I can speak to this degree that he can, but I can tell you um, that the courses that we're really focused on about that balanced piece really are found in the senior high. It's usually the one semester courses because of how the, that curriculum is delivered. Obviously, for those that are on a full year track, that's, that's a little uh, easier. And I use that word very, very liberally, but I would say that um, that's less of a concern about meeting all of those deadlines for testing and prepare, uh, preparing students versus that one semester. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea under that C that we're, right. we're, we're taking two days from the spring and moving them right. or vice versa. Vice versa. But yeah, so that, but to know if we're not really losing instructional days Correct. because of mandatory testing would be important. Um, and then the second thing I was going to ask you on, you, you mentioned that there were a lot of people who are accessing the link via various social media outlets. Mm -hmm. Are you renewing those posts on a routine basis so that, you know, the, the, if it's like on a, a Facebook post or something that it's kicking back up to the top of people's feeds or Twitter or however, wherever, I don't know. however I'm we're actually doing gonna, it? I'm going to ask Leslie to speak to that. Leslie, can you help me with that? I think we've put it out a couple of times, but we could do, we could do it again. Yeah, I mean, that, it, it you know, if we're going to post it to social media, eventually it just falls off the radar. Right. So maybe just do that every few days or something to get it kicked back up sure. to the top. Because you seem to be getting good result from that. We are, and I actually listened even more carefully than I was trying to be, uh, to your question. But yes, uh, we've taken the opportunity to promote the survey itself beyond obviously not promoting a particular calendar, but every opportunity we see. Um, and if you were to propose something else being posted, whether you do or don't do that, um, PPA stands on the right to assist us. They've been very gracious to comment on their website and speak for us as well. And so we're trying to capitalize on everyone. We do have our faculty council meeting coming up, which would be more even more reflective of staff. We also have key communicators that's coming up, and that would be our first meeting of the year, and it will be a primary tar not target, primary topic <laughs> that night. So, Carla, putting together option C, mm -hmm. you were trying to present an option reflective of some of the feedback that you're Correct. hearing, right? Correct. So, primarily, the, the feedback represented in this option is a fall break. Yes. Right? Um, it also, um, I will say, one of the things I'm pleased about overall is that the, the responders to our survey 55, a little over 55 percent of them are parents, which makes me happy. Um, then staff follows, obviously, in a close second. But if, if, if um, I'll use this example, if we wanted to talk about the, the term earlier, um, start earlier, uh, some people will say the, comp, the open field questions are very, um, very specific and very prescriptive per person. So sorting through those is not the easiest thing, especially if you're considering what does the term earlier mean to one person versus another. That term's going to be consistent with responses, however, one person saying we do not want an earlier start date, someone else is saying yes, we love an earlier start date because we want to be sure and get out before Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. So some of the, um, let me 
can find my sheet right here. Some of the things that I'll share with you from, this, from the comments on the survey where we see some trends. Um, while many like getting out before Memorial Day, they would prefer a later start date. Um, suggesting options like extending the hours in the day. That's very, I mean, that's very common right now. Some people have done some really creative things in districts surrounding us and more outward. They've been very creative with that and some we're just not, we're not, um, we're not able to take advantage of. Uh, some parents have expressed concern um, and want to start later because of the UIL summer practice time um, for all those different activities, family vacations, summer heat, shortened summer, um, wanting us to line up with other districts nationwide. These are just swipes at, at some of the ones that we find to be the most uh, recurring themes. Um, those embracing the earliest start date or the earlier start date, like the idea of getting out before Memorial Day, having balanced semesters to the degree possible, um, easier for working parents with limited childcare options. Those are very prominent in the, in the comments. Um, the other preferences expressed I've already gone through, um, which are very typical. But I did want to give you some examples of those that were very specific that we might not all come together and, and create that list. I, I would like to say that when I look at option C, as, mm -hmm. and I love the fall break, but we've got an 11 day difference in the semesters. Right. And that's a big concern from my point of view when I look at um, kids in secondary school who are taking one semester courses. I couldn't um, agree more strongly. I, I personally don't see any benefit to C. Okay. I don't think starting on Wednesday is significantly better academic than starting on Monday. And I don't think the two extra days is not really even a fall break. You've got two days one week and two days the next week, which is still hard to plan any sort of vacation. I mean, we've advocated for years about having balanced semesters. And so to go to a plan that has 11 days difference mm -hmm. and tell our families you need to start early, to me that's kind of a lose-lose situation. Yeah, I, I certainly think that Plan A still meets the academic needs of our children better than anything we've seen. And, and the early surveys from parents show that the August 13th date is certainly not a deal breaker. In fact, right. it's preferred. Yeah. So I, I think it needs to come back to academics. More academic days before the tests happen in the spring, more time before the AP tests, and then the balanced semesters. I agree. I will share yeah. with you, we have about six days of play in regard to testing for the senior high schools for the uh, second semester. That varies depending on retest and those kinds of things, but I did want to bring that up as well. Uh, certainly that decision, the decision for adoption is going to ultimately be yours. I want to support you in getting to the, all of us do, want to support you in getting to the right calendar. I will say, um, again, I think having the teacher input from an education perspective regarding the best academic arrangement is very important to the process. Uh, it's not exclusive. But certainly it's very important and I don't think we've heard as much as we will once we're able to show these options and get some discussion. What I would like to know is um, based on Ms. Richards comment or any of those that you may have, do you want to consider the option C or would you rather not put that forward? Considering that we're halfway through. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of option C, but I have, I have a number of comments. Um, and, and forgive me if this is a, a new new trustee question but are we not assessed by the state on instructional min minutes now versus days yeah so it's possible it's possible to use minutes as a barometer so i guess i'd like somebody from staff i don't i don't know who but to, to help me understand the challenges of adding say 10 minutes a day to the days we are in instructional versus versus what we have today that would give us more flexibility mm -hmm. calendar-wise. So just, again, Did we, forgive me if this is a dumb do question. No, 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 that's, that's a fair question. I think we might have received a report last year, and um, a lot of it has to do with transportation and the three-tiered bus system, and then you've got activity buses. And so I don't recall the outcome, but it seems to me that the senior high kids might not get home until after dinner. <laughs> something crazy like I, I will say not to interrupt the board discussion but to just offer a comment um, in our staff study and cabinet study of the different calendars and all the different issues that are represented by each one and there are issues with all um, the question was asked of transportation the what if the what if the 10 minutes whether it's all before all after split all those different things and there were some conclusions and uh, preferences that were given by our I would say preferences possibilities 
um, and those that might be impossibilities were shared with our transportation department. Does anybody want to share anything that we talked about there? And I'm not saying it completely. No, we were just we're thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. it, what we had talked about was if we had to add to elementary and elementary and middle school currently go 15 minutes less than high school and senior high. Um, so we had talked about if we had to add additional minutes at elementary and, and middle, we, we can't, that would be very difficult to accommodate. I was trying to remember if we've talked about adding across the board. I don't think that we did. Yeah. I mean, if you. We focused on. I mean, I'm, I'm no transportation expert, but if you add, and I'll just make up a number, 10 minutes across the board, what's the challenge? I mean. Well, I'm going to branch here just, or a limb, to say that 10 minutes on top of the senior high or those upper level grades. Mm -hmm would extend their day beyond what is necessary for instruction. It, that would truly because, be because of a transportation issue. That's not an academic That's issue. Right. And that has contract implications. Mm -hmm. Correct. Does it for teaching, for the teachers? Not for teachers, because they're not hourly. Now, I don't know how if we were taking right. days away. Right, right. If we were taking days away, we would have to address that. Um, in in uh, contracts with with professional staff on the campus, but we have the leeway. We could do that. Other other districts have have forged that path, but it would have an implication. I do have one other thing I'd like to share with you as you're considering the next step, how to lead us forward. Um, on calendar A. We do end, it's proposed that the last day of instruction would be May 24th before Memorial Day. But if you will recall, it does create complications in regard to when we would schedule and have an opportunity to get into the Star Center. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, we, are, we just received, <laughs> and I feel a little funny saying this, but it's true, um, just because it's been such a tentative situation, but we just received Friday the uh, contract from the star which we've been waiting for it's it's certainly been on their end to put that together and we just received that to hopefully qualify um, our date for this current year so if you look to next year if we ended before memorial day i think there will be a competition for the saturdays which are the only days that we can be hosted in the star center and i think i'm saying that wrong i think it's the star <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> Dr. Cooper will probably tell me about that tomorrow. <laughs> well, isn't just the main issue how many weeks after the conclusion of school would yes. you then hold graduation? Well, traditionally, when we've had the last day of school on a Friday, it's usually the following Thursday. And that wouldn't, would not likely be possible. I think that's a tradition most people in the district wouldn't even know that that was the tradition. So. But again, it's just a consideration. I really want to give you all the information that I can. And then in regard to um, draft B, you all haven't had much to say about that one, so maybe it's really not worth commenting on. I'm not sure. Um, but if you notice, students would have their last day of instruction two days after Memorial Day, which frankly is, I think, a, a bit of a leap to get families tuned back in to school for two days, <laughs> regardless of what grade level their students are in. Um, which is one of the concessions made with calendar C is where we were able to put a couple of days back in October for a fall break and bring them back in a more reasonable way that would more academically suit than having two lost days if they indeed did not respect the calendar in that regard. Carla, I have one question. Uh, I saw the survey and uh, it has which option do you choose A uh -huh. or B and then an open-ended uh, question. Can you do you know or have a sense of where more than half the people responding in that section suggesting a later start or less than half? I'm looking for a specific piece. Um, in the overall responses out of the essentially 4,100 responses at this point, 189 opted not to make a calendar selection. 
-hmm. and 2,704 opted not to leave a comment. Mm -hmm. So again, not to make a great deal of assumptions, but I think there's one that um, some were comfortable selecting A or B without needing to comment or propose any changes. They saw a clear cut, yes or no, or, or not yes or no, but their preference. Um, I don't know if that helps with what you're asking for. I mean, again. You know, one, I'll tell you what, what I felt when I got the survey. It was, um, I didn't feel that there was a question there on would you like to not start that week at all. I was, uh, is it A or B? And sometimes, you know, when you're asking, is it A or B, I'll give you A or B and mm -hmm. really not think that there's an option to suggest uh, maybe something else, maybe not starting that week. So I, I was wondering of those who actually did provide comment, um, what percentage roughly would actually say start later? Parents prefer calendar draft A at 65% with 35% opting for calendar B. Mm -hmm. And the comments again are very, um, they're not easy to separate, but those are trends that we're seeing. So if you're looking at parents only just at this point, because obviously while we're talking, hopefully the respondents are coming in, um, over 2,100 made a selection between calendar A and B with 108 parents skipping that section com completely. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. On the survey, when we have a response from a parent, is there a way to ascertain whether they're a parent of an um, elementary student or a secondary student? Is I don't think we did that. We did that by a parent, by staff member, by a staff member who's also a parent, and by students. Okay. Am I saying this correctly? Yes, and also uh, community members who don't have. Yes. Okay. That was the category that some of us were interested in as business owners and people who serve our community that may not have a student. And did we have a category for people from New Jersey? <laughs> Only if you asked for it specifically. And I don't think you did. All right. Well, <laughs> but we still get feedback from them. It's still, it's not over. Yeah. I mean, just as a follow on to what you're saying, if a, if a third date had been put out there, it, it, but it hasn't yet, but it's, right. it's impossible to know what the 4,000 people would have thought about, right? Well, may, may, I, may I share this? A third date, if we had had one for this particular calendar save, survey, would have been reflective of the calendar we're serving under now. Mm -hmm. And right. the board said the other two. We didn't, we didn't say that we wanted to, to mirror the current school year, and that would have been the most likely third day that would have been put on a survey. Did we say that? Yeah. That was yeah. before you were elected. Oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> is the, well, I mean, that can was I informally, BG. I mean, because the, I don't have 4,000 responses, but the, the feedback that I got mm -hmm. from lots of football and band parents was right. they'd like to see a third week option. So is that something the board would be interested in or not? What do you mean a third, a third week option? A, uh, following on 2018, August 20th is a Monday. Oh, start the so, uh, I I did hear from a lot of parents again, not four thousand. Okay, so but so here's here's the trade-off, right? Oh, I, I so that's the so in comparison to calendar A, we have eighty-seven days in the fall semester, and we have ninety in the spring, right? So a three-day delta, and if I subtract out six in the spring, um, it's actually eighty-seven, eighty-four, six for the test days, right? For the senior highs. So I'm just going to use that as my baseline example. If we switched from the Monday the 13th start to the 20th start, then I'm going to have to take five days off the 87 and then make that 82 days in the fall. I'm going to add them to the spring. So it's not, it's, it's a matter of balance. Mm -hmm. Does that, um, does that create the best academic outcome? Oh. That, that's the question. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, the next calendar starts on a Wednesday, so that would be one, two, it's a couple more days. So it's just a question of, do we want that distribution? Oh, we, well, point taken. And you and I had a very good conversation about this, because there are 
hundreds of factors that go into this and hundreds of impacts that, that I as a parent and as a trustee may not see. Um, I, ju I just think it's something we should consider. If it's not something that the board has a taste for, then well, I, we can you know, advise staff accordingly. I thought we actually did talk about this and didn't take a formal vote, but took a head nod of whether or not we are interested in starting the, the week, the third week, or whether we wanted that middle week. And right. I thought that the idea, that's, I thought that's where these two calendars came from. Right. We said we wanted A and B to start that middle week. And we did consider whether or not we want a third week. I'm not interested in that. Right. I want to start earlier. When does UIL let us start practice? What's the date? August 1st. August 1st. August 1st. August 1st. So has there been conversation? I know we've asked this multiple times, but I don't know what the latest is. What does UIL say about this District of Innovation flexibility and their potential flexibility? It's, it's my understanding with uh, conversation with Kathy Cuttis, as she's had direct conversation with them, and, and I think we've also seen this in an in a actual communication. They are obviously aware of the DOI process has been going on the last year or two, and their, their comment is still remains the same as they are not looking at other adjusting their August 1st um, start date, so to speak. Yeah, in my conversation with the superintendent and Prosper, I happened to say, why couldn't we say X number of days before when you start? And he his comment to me was, don't bother. We asked that question, and it took about five seconds for them to say no thank you uh, so that's that's basically we've heard from everybody who's broached that subject with UIL that they're not interested in making that change so who do we have here on the executive committee for UIL like some somebody from Plano yeah I'm on the one for fine arts for fine arts yeah. but who we don't have I mean there's a a district each district has an executive committee that you know Gerald Brantz and then the other athletic directors from each of the comp competing districts uh, are make up the the actual executive committee for like for us mm -hmm. district 66a now the music I think are a little bit uh, different alignment so to speak and I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. they're well I, set up. I'm only asking because it makes me wonder I mean, how can they be so disconnected from what the rest of the state is doing? Mm -hmm. And the change in law. And, and the change in law. How, how is it okay for them to just be ironclad no? Why, I mean, shouldn't we, like, communicate with them as one and then get some of our colleagues to communicate and say, we're asking you, we're petitioning you to mm -hmm. consider modifying your position um, I, instead of just taking it? I don't like to just take it. <laughs> I don't know why we can't make an official ask and have others do the same and kind of lobby I guess it. One one thing to offer, and I'm not I'm not trying to sway one way or the other. And, and Tammy, on your on that August August first piece from a band standpoint, and I don't know the exact number of hours, but I believe it's the they are also they are able to do non marching activities. I want, I want to say either a certain number of hours even before August 1st. Many directors will use the early part of summer before they go to camp. Um, they'll often use, though they'll back it up to, uh, to uh, late July and do some preliminary things, but it's non-marching. It's just kind of the instructional type things. But then the other piece that really my, my initial point is they're not Regardless of the calendar and their August 1st for, for music, for, for band, and then it's later for athletics, practice still gets to occur. It just looks different because we're already in in-service time and we're already, or we're gonna be in the school year starts. So it's not like we're being uh, somewhat overly shorted. I mean, that, and that can be argued a, a little bit, but they're still getting to practice. It just looks different because of the what's going on during the day that they will adjust that now you, that's that's still going to be a good debate that people will give input on staff included uh, mm -hmm. but 
you're going to have maybe some band directors say, you know what, yeah, we'll, we'll make it work. Or uh, head coaches, our volleyball coaches of football, we'll, we'll make it work. But it's, uh, I've heard things very pro. They, okay, start earlier because that gets gets us more into a routine, and our kids are in a routine. They're in a school day. It's very systematic and and not the, like okay, well today we got to do this in the morning because we've been service, and then okay we have this and all the it's it's just gets to be almost a benefit to be in a more uniform structure to, as, as, it, uh, as the school day starts playing out. But I just didn't want it to get lost in the conversation. The, the, the programs still get to, are still getting to practice and prepare. It's not like they're having I'll, to wait. On I'll something. say this, at, after a, tomorrow morning at the chamber first, then I lead, both which will be very enjoyable. I will try to get on the phone <laughs> with anyone at UIL and then suggest there may be forthcoming a written uh, request. On, on and I don't know part. if everybody agrees with the suggestion, but I just... I agree with your suggestion, and I believe we have other districts in the state that would probably have the same And if you look at the, the, the start dates this year for everybody in the area, there was only one exception when it that was not the 21st. And I think they're gonna be, and that was Garland, and that was because of a construction issue, not because of any other reason. So uh, collectively, peop the districts in this region at least are moving forward. And there were 400, I think, <coughs> districts that had district of innovation plans with this flexibility in it. I mean, that's a huge number, and it's probably going to only increase. I just uh -huh. I feel like there's, it's worth having a conversation. Okay, so back to the question, is there a C? Op is this C option? Is what I'm hearing the answer to the C question is no. Okay, is, that, is there anybody who can't live with that? This particular C is not, not going to be presented as an option, is what I'm hearing. The what, in next steps, would you, never mind, I think you've already answered the So question. the next question is, is there some other option B that uh, Greg is suggesting that is week three. I think it, based. Defeats, it defeats what we've been trying to do with districts of innovation. I think that this year's calendar was a baby step into what we're trying to do for next year. I think we would lose ground if we went to a week three start. We're back where we were. Okay. Other feedback? All right. It's option A, it's option B. Continue to survey. Okay. We're and in just it. as a point of uh, point of order, I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, we're starting in all three options. We're starting the second semester on Kim Jong Un's birthday. <laughs> Not sure if that's intentional. I don't think that qualifies as a holy day. <laughs> so. <laughs> what would you like for me to say? <laughs> I, I don't think that needs that's a non that's a non issue okay. not for us thank you Carla for thank you. for giving us a summary of the feedback and I appreciate we appreciate all the work that you guys are doing to collect that feedback I know it's hard to analyze it when it comes in that commentary fashion so thank you for giving us an option in the conversation and thank you for all the ideas shared. Uh, last item is the conclusion of the public comment session. I now convene the 15 minute public comment session on non-agenda topics. Each speaker has up to three minutes. Ms. Oliver, do we have any comment cards? We do, Ms. Carolyn Mobius. Okay. Carolyn Mobius, 1412 Park Fee Lane, Murphy. Okay, I, wait a minute. Oh, Nancy, will you give her? Uh, oh, okay. give her three minute time. Three minutes. I'll get it. Just give me a second, Caroline, to get it done. Okay. Go. You may go. Okay. So the agenda item, or what I want to talk about is not an agenda item, but it's fine arts. And then a roundabout way, I wanted to say, I don't know if y'all have seen um, Plano East's um, new weight room and field and how wonderful it looks. I can just tell you. When I received some pictures, I was blown away. Blown away, it looks wonderful. Um, what I would like to say is, as you're going through the budget this year, 
please consider the fine arts program. I didn't push for this when I was in y'all's position since I had a child highly involved in the fine arts. They're, they're under similar <coughs> situation where I think there are things that need to be replaced. There's definitely issues at um, Plano East, which you can find out on your own. But um, I would just encourage you, remind you that some of the things we had discussed before, if we're offering the program, what is it that we consider Plano standards? And is Plano standards you know, a stage that's functioning well, sound equipment that isn't crackling all the time, um, the, um, you know, how many programs or shows are we going to, that PISD is going to support for the theater groups? Is it only gonna be one a semester or should it be more? I think those are things that you really, um, it's a little bit different, but I think that's things that need to be considered. I think they've been put on the back burner for quite a while. And um, I think there's useful lives that haven't been considered for instruments and sound equipment and stuff like that that really <coughs> needs to be in place. There, should, it, there shouldn't be um, wait till disaster hits and let's fix things. It should be um, more on a routine basis. So One minute. That is... All I have to say, I miss y'all. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm not here. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thank you for your comments. And with no further business, this meeting of the Board of Trustees is adjourned at 9.13 p.m. <laughs> Bye.